All right, good morning. Let's get started. We've got, um, we're in the middle of our uh, angular momentum. We've started to introduce the fact that we can, an object moving in a straight line can have angular momentum if when it collides with something, it can get that thing to rotate. So if it's line of velocity, if it's line of momentum passes right through the axis of rotation of our object, then, uh, then it can't cause rotation, right? It can't get it to rotate. But if there's some perpendicular distance to the line of the velocity, the line of the momentum and the axis of rotation, then it can cause that object to rotate if it collides with it. <clears throat> so we have two, two ways of doing angular momentum. One is for an object that's moving in a straight line, and one is for an object that's rotating. Okay. <clears throat> we also are putting together now some of the things that we've learned about energy, rotational kinetic energy, things like that. And now we can start to solve uh, problems where, you know, uh, uh, the pulley has mass. Uh, we can solve problems uh, like we did with energy and momentum earlier, translational energy and linear momentum, where we have to combine them like a ballistic pendulum. We have to combine the two. We can do that now with angular momentum and rotational kinetic energy. So we'll practice some of those things today. All right, let's do, let's take a look at this problem first. <clears throat> I think we did this already. Did we do this already? So we're going to look at our favorite problem. If we're given all the masses, kinetic coefficient of friction, um, the shape of the pulley, we can find the tension in the string and the acceleration. So remember, tension in the string on either side of the pulley now is different because the pulley has mass. If the pulley is massless, we say the tension is the same on both sides of the pulley. But if the pulley has mass, how is it going to 
accelerate with the masses, how is it going to accelerate if there's not a different torque, if there's not a net torque acting on it? It's not. So the tensions have to be different on either side of that pulley now. Okay, what do we do with a problem like this? We're look, let's think about what we're being asked for. We're being asked for tension and acceleration, forces and acceleration. We should be thinking Newton's law, F equals MA, right? That gives us forces and acceleration. If we were being asked for final velocity, we should think more maybe energy to find that. In fact, we'll do that one next. We'll do the same problem again, but we'll look for a final velocity. Okay, Newton's law problem. We're looking for an acceleration. We're looking for a force, F equals MA. Let's draw a free body diagram for every mass in our system. We have three masses now in our system. We have M1, M2, and the pulley. Okay, what's, uh, what's touching M1? What do we know? We, well, we have to know which direction this thing goes. When we release it, uh, M2 goes down and M1 goes up. It's gonna move in this direction. Okay, so if we know what direction it goes, then we can put the friction in. We have to be able to do that. Normal force, friction force. Of course, it's moving, it's kinetic friction, it's sliding, the surfaces are sliding, there's motion between them. We can break up the force of gravity into a normal component and a parallel to the incline component. And these, of course, are M1s, M1, M1. And the last thing that's touching that block is the string, tension from string one. Block two. The only thing touching it is the string. What can reach in from a distance? Gravity. <clears throat> now the pulley, we want to draw, and I'm trying to do it for everything. The boxes, it doesn't really matter. They're not rotating, but the pulley is. So we need to draw an extended free body diagram, a, a real free body diagram where the object's shape is represented, is represented, and every force is indicated as to where it's acting on that shape so we can figure out things like torque. Gravity acts on that pulley, right? Some kind of support force is holding it up. There's a tension pulling down over here, T2, and a tension over here, T1. For every mass in your system, you end up with an equation. For M1, we're gonna have some of the forces equals MA. For M2, some of the forces equals MA. And for the pulley, some of the torque equals I alpha. So for every mass in the system, we get an equation. We'll have three equations, which means we can solve for three unknowns. And that's good because there are three unknowns in this problem, right? T1, T2, and the acceleration.
I'll pick up the, in, up the incline as my positive direction. So we're, we're looking at that as my positive direction. That means I've got tension one in my positive direction, friction, and uh, the weight along the incline, mg sine theta, in the negative direction, that has to equal ma. If I look at my perpendicular direction, perpendicular to the incline, I get the normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. So I can plug that in for my friction. So there's my first equation. I have two unknowns, the tension one and the acceleration. Everything else is given. So I need another equation. I'll keep looking. I'll go to mass two. I say the sum of the forces on two. is m2 times the acceleration. What direction do I choose as my positive direction for two? Down. You could choose any direction you want, but then your accelerations will be different and that is tricky to keep track of. So the rule of thumb I have is once I pick a positive direction for the first mass in the system, and I said up the incline was the positive direction. So once I pick that, when M1 goes in the positive direction, everything else in my system has to go in the positive direction. That way my accelerations are the same. When M1 goes up the incline, M2 goes down. So that'll be my positive direction for M2. That means I have M2G in the positive direction, T2 in the negative direction. And there's my second equation with two unknowns, but now I have a new one unknown. I have T2 in there. So I've got a total of three unknowns, T1, T2, and the acceleration. I only have two equations. I have to keep going. I need a third equation. Luckily, I have another mass in my system. I have the pulley. And for this object, I'm going to say the sum of the torque is I alpha. And what direction will I choose as positive? Into the page or clockwise into the page is a little more correct. Because when M1 goes up the hill in the positive direction, what does the pulley do? The pulley turns in that direction. So I have to make that my positive direction so my accelerations are the same. Let's add up all the torques now. What do we have? We've got uh, uh, T2 causing the pulley to rotate in the positive direction. So I've got positive torque from T2. And what is torque? It's force, which is T2, times the lever arm, which is the radius of the pulley, because that's where the, the force is being applied to the pulley, at the rim of the pulley. And in the negative direction, I've got T1 creating torque in the other direction. And that's its force times its lever arm. I have two other forces here. I'm just going to write them in. I've got the support force. But what is the lever arm there? 
It's zero. It passes right through. If you extend the line of the force, it passes right through the axle of the pulley, the axis of rotation. It has a lever arm of zero. The support force doesn't cause the pulley to rotate at all. If there were no other forces there, the support force wouldn't cause it to rotate. And our weight also has a lever arm of zero. So those don't do anything for this equation. All right, so now, <clears throat> now uh, we want to just deal with a couple of more things. We don't, we weren't given I or alpha. We were given, we need to get those uh, in terms of things we, we know. I for a solid disc rotating about its center point, we can look up on our table. And that's one half the mass of the pulley times the radius squared. That's I. <clears throat> now, if the pulley had a different shape to it, I might be different, right? If the pulley was a hollow wheel, then it would be mr squared, not one half mr squared. Uh, if the pulley was a, uh, had a spherical shape or a, some other shape, it might be different, but it's a disc, a solid disc. So it's one half mr squared, you look it up. And then A over R we use for alpha because we're, what we care about is the rim of the pulley. That's where the rope is. The boxes are accelerating with A, acceleration of A. The rope is accelerating with an acceleration of A. And the rim of the pulley has a tangential acceleration of A. So we can get that in terms of the rotational acceleration alpha and the radius of the pulley. And this, we can simplify this a little bit, uh, move the R's over. They actually all cancel out. The R's all cancel out. We get T2 minus T1 is M pulley over two times the acceleration. And now we have three equations, three unknowns, and we're done. We can, we can, the physics is done. We can do some algebra now to solve for them. <clears throat> All right with this one. So let's do the same problem again. I know all the R's cancel. You see that? You have an R on the left side that comes down and cancels one of the R's and the other one can't, they all cancel. Uh, yeah, so we are we are interested in right the acceleration. We know that this disc has some angular acceleration alpha, but what we really care about is what the tangential acceleration is at the rim of the pulley because that's where the rope is. That's, that's the acceleration the rope has. Well, we can always convert back and forth between 
tangential acceleration and angular acceleration using this formula, A is R alpha, right? So the, the distance, the distance covered along the arc and the angle are related by this equation, right? The arc length equals R theta if theta is in radians. That's the definition of a radian, right? And we can take a derivative of that and we get the velocity, the linear velocity at the rim of the pulley is R times the angular velocity of the pulley. And we can take the derivative of that and we get the tangential acceleration is R, I guess I should use the same R's all the time. R times uh, alpha, the uh, rotational acceleration. So that's the relationship between the two. <clears throat> and since that's where the pulley is, the pulley's at the rim of the, of the uh, sorry, the rope, that's where the rope is. The rope is at the, at the rim of the pulley, then we can, uh, that's what we want. We want the tangential acceleration is the same as the acceleration of the rope, which is the same as the acceleration of the blocks. Just before M2 hits the ground. Um, given all the same stuff plus the initial is zero. Now, with this problem, we actually could have solved the first problem here. And, uh, oh, and H. And H. If we were given H initially, we could have solved this problem and gotten the acceleration and then solved another problem where we did a kinematics problem, right? Because the acceleration here is constant. It's constant. But if we put a spring in there, then the acceleration would not be constant. We really would have no choice but to use energy to solve that problem. Kinematics equations only work when the acceleration is constant. All right, so we're gonna do this problem again using energy. I'll just re-sketch it here. And I'll go ahead and draw out an energy bar chart. Energy bar chart is a really good way for thinking about problems like this as you're getting started with them. You know, after you do a few, maybe you don't need them anymore. I don't know. But, you know, certainly if I'm just going to, if I just drop an object and say, how fast is it? You know, I've got a, a book here and I want to know how fast is it going when it hits the ground. I'm not going to draw an energy bar chart. I just say, uh, MGH equals one half MV squared, right? And I solve for it. <clears throat> I've done this a few times, right? But, you know, when the 
when the problem gets complicated, we've got rotational energy, we've got translational energy, we've got friction, we've got, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. You know, if, if the bar chart helps you, draw the bar chart. That's the whole point is to get it right in the end, get those points. If it takes you an extra five minutes, it's worth it. Okay. Uh, our initial mechanical energy. We've got three masses in our system, right? So we could have K1, K2, K pulley. <clears throat> we, uh, mass one might go up or down, mass two might go up or down. Our pulley is fixed to the earth. It's not going up or down, so I don't need gravitational energy for the pulley. I guess if I had it set up where the pulley was going up or down, I would need gravitational energy for the pulley also, right? What happens between the initial state and the final state? Well, we've got some friction. And we might have external forces, although if we set, our, if we set this up where we include the earth in our system, we won't have any. And then uh, what happened over here? And then I'm going to copy this and put it at the end also because we might have the same ones. Uh, we could have that same energy at the end, right? There we are. Now let's make that bar chart. So we've got positive. Here's our equal sign. All right, is anything moving at the beginning? Is anything moving at the beginning? No. We start out at rest. That was given in the problem that everything starts out at rest, V initial is zero. If nothing's moving, there's no kinetic energy. No kinetic energy for one, two, or the pulley. No kinetic energy. Are things moving at the end? Yes. This is the split second before the block hits the ground. The blocks are moving. The pulley's rotating. Everything has kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is always positive. I don't know the relative of which one has more until I, if I knew what the masses were, I could, maybe I could start figuring out which one would have more because I know they all are going to have the M1 and M2 are going to have the same speed, but I don't care. Right now, all I care about is that there's kinetic energy. And as a reminder to me, this equation helps me remember that they're positive. All right, does block one go up or down during this process? it goes up. So let's call the lowest point in, in the problem for block one, let's call that zero. That would be at the beginning. So we'll have block one start with zero gravitational energy since it starts at its lowest point. And that means that at the end, it has to have, if it goes up farther away from the Earth's center, then it has to have more gravitational energy. Well, what's more than zero? a positive number. So it has some positive amount of gravitational potential energy at the end. Block two. Block two goes down during this process, right? It starts high up, ends up close to the surface of the earth. So let's call the ending point zero, the lowest point in the problem zero. And if it starts out higher than that, it has to have more. What's more than zero? A positive number. So we put a positive there. You could also have negative gravitational energies, right? But most students would prefer this, I think. Do we have friction in our system? Yes, we do. We only have one friction force, just block one. So that's why I just put one friction, work done by friction. If block two is also sliding on a surface, then you'd need two 
work done by friction on block one, work done by friction on block two, right? You just expand this equation to accommodate your situation. Work done by friction, negative. And do we have any external forces in our system? No, because we've included the Earth. We have gravitational energy. As soon as I put this term in here, gravitational energy, you knew the Earth was part of the system. And there's nothing else here. There, we don't have one end of a rope. Uh, we don't have a hand reaching in, pushing or pulling on something. Those are signs that you kind of need to account for uh, external work on the system. But in this case, we don't have any of that. The Earth is part of our system, no external forces acting on it. Now we write out our equation. This, remember, the bar chart is just a tool to get the equation correct. So we'll start out with this term right here. This tells us that M2GH, that's the uh, initial gravitational energy of mass two, uh, minus, because we've got this negative, negative work done by friction there, minus the friction force. Friction force is mu times the normal force. Mu times the normal force is the friction force, times the distance, because this is work done. Force times distance is work done. Don't forget the uh, and then we have our equal sign. Question is uh, uh, block one can start. Yeah, you can. So we can define zero to be anywhere, and we can define two different zeros for the two different masses just as long as we're consistent. So if you, call, if you call this zero, and this, um, this will be a y1, uh, and then at the end of the problem, the block is up here at y2, then what do you have on this side of the equation? On this side of the equation, instead of a zero there, you're gonna have an M1, G, Y1. And on this side of the equation, you're gonna have an M1, G, Y1 plus Y2, right? And then you're, this is an equal sign in the middle here, right? So then you're gonna subtract. And you're going to end up with zero on the left side of the equation and M1GY2 on the other side. Not Y, uh, sorry. Uh, y, this is just Y2, not Y1 plus Y2. Well, yeah, let's, let's do it Y1 plus Y2. So Y1 is this distance here, and Y2 is this distance here. Let's do that. Okay. So this is Y1 plus Y2. And you see what happened. We ended up with zero on this side of the equation, and just the difference, the change in height, which is y2, on the other side. Well, we could just define this as zero right here, get rid of all this, define this as zero. So we start out at zero, and what do we end up with? MGY2 on the other side, right? It's the same thing, you see that now? <clears throat> because all that matters with gravitational energy is the change. That's why we can do that. All that matters is the change. It started out, let 
it started out as a, as a certain amount. Yes, you can declare different zeros for every mass because all that matters are the changes between the beginning height and the end height. So you, you can have gravitational energies on both sides of the equation for M1, but by the time you simplify your equation, you're gonna end up with the same thing as if you had called one of them zero and me measured the height from there. Okay. <clears throat> All right, this is our, our, our equal sign. Then we've got uh, kinetic energy, one half M1 V final squared. And then we have one half M2 V final squared. And then we have one half I omega squared. That's uh, that one and that one. Now we've got one more term. One more term. M1 G and the distance M1 goes up, which is H sine theta. Right, because M1, M1 is going up this distance, we're calling that H. But what we need is this, I'll call it Y. So Y is equal to H times the sine of theta. We need the vertical distance it goes up, not how much it slides up the incline. Okay, so we're almost done. What are we missing? I for that rotating pulley, and we said it's a solid disc. We look up a solid disc on our formula sheet. Should we do that? <clears throat> we get out our formula sheet and we look up on here, solid disc. It's this one right here. It says solid cylinder. Remember, it doesn't matter if there's mass, if it's a flat disc, flat disc, or whether we spread it out and it becomes a cylinder, it does not matter. What matters is how the mass is distributed about the axis of rotation. So a flat disc and a cylinder, same rotational inertia. One half MR squared. Now, if it was a thin walled hollow hoop, if it was like a, a bicycle wheel, right, where the mass is all at the rim of the wheel and there's nothing in the middle, then we look over here at G, it says thin walled hollow cylinder, I is equal to MR squared, okay? One half, in this case, one half MR squared. And we have one more thing we have to figure out here. We've got omega. And omega is the tangential velocity over the radius, V over R. So we can plug those in and then we can solve for this.
That's our only unknown would be V final. Uh, if the speeds are different, we would have to have a situation um, where the pulleys create some kind of uh, mechanical advantage, right? Like, for example, if we did, uh, if we did this, um, So in this case, you can see that if M2, if M2 drops by two meters, M1 only goes up by one meter. Anytime you have that, you, this, that's how, the easiest thing to think about, right? If you move one of the blocks by one meter, how much does the other one move? If it moves one meter, then everything is fixed together, right? If the distance is the same, the velocities have to be the same, the accelerations have to be the same, everything has to be the same. In this case, M2 moves two meters, M1 only moves one meter. So the distance is half as much for M1, the velocity is gonna be half as much, and the acceleration is going to be half as much. Everything will be half for M1. Uh, question, is it always uh, true the tensions are different with a weighted pulley? If there's acceleration, if there's acceleration, so if I have a pulley that is either, um, what's the word I'm looking for, is either, sitting there at rest, if that pulley is just sitting there at rest, not rotating, what do I know about T1 and T2? They're the same, right? And if it's, if it's rotating with a constant, angular speed and there's no alpha, alpha is equal to zero, then I also know T1 and T2 are equal, right? But if alpha is not zero, if that pulley has angular acceleration, if it rotates faster and faster and faster, or slower and slower and slower, right? If alpha is not zero, there's angular acceleration, then T1 and T2 must be different. A question about the support force on this guy right here. Uh, I don't know the exact direction that the support force points, but I know it has to be roughly in this direction that I drew it. Why is that? Because the pulley is not going anywhere, right? The pulley is not falling down. I've got T1 kind of pulling down at an angle. I've got T2 pulling straight down. I've got the weight of the pulley pulling straight down. I've got lots of stuff pulling down on that pulley, but the pulley is not going down. So the support force must be holding it up, right? It must have a big, big component up. And the pulley also is not moving left or right. And T2 is just pulling straight down. It wouldn't cause it to move left or right. The weight of the pulley is pulling straight down. It wouldn't cause it to move left or right. But T1 is pulling down and to the left. It would cause the pulley to move to the left slightly. So the support force has to be pushing to the right slightly. A big upward force and a little bit to the right. And so that's what I drew there. But we really 
we really don't care because, because we don't use it in this problem. I guess I could have asked you maybe what the support force was, but that's a different problem. We'll talk about that later. All right, let's uh, go over some of these applications. Lots of applications. We sort of have been weaving some of them in. <clears throat> um, I was hoping to show you, uh, I did some video demonstrations, but for some reason they're not playing. Uh, I think I have to reboot my computer. Um, but we, we, I do have these written down here. Um, Applications for rotational motion. Lots of interesting applications, right? Anything that spins, motors, pulleys, things like that. We talked about rotational inertia, MR squared for a point mass, right? Well, you've watched those tightrope walkers walking across uh, tight ropes, and what do they do? They hold that big long bar. And that big long bar has a very large rotational inertia. So it resists changes in rotation. They can kind of push against it a little bit and it gives them a split second to catch their balance and resituate themselves. And that's why they have that long bar that they hold on to. It has a big rotational inertia, resists changes in rotation. Rotational kinetic energy. So this bus, this was in the 50s. They had these buses, hybrid buses. <laughs> they did not use batteries to store the energy. When the bus slowed down, they used a big flywheel. A flywheel is a, a wheel with a lot of rotational inertia used to store energy. So it had this big flywheel. And uh, it, as the bus uh, slowed down, the energy got put into the flywheel, got this flywheel spinning. And so the bus sat there at the red light and this wheel would spin, storing the energy. And then when it went to start up again, it would, uh, that wheel would slow down and it would take the energy out of that wheel and make the bus go again, <clears throat> a hybrid bus. And uh, not only that, but they actually, <laughs> they actually didn't use um, fuel they had at the bus stops, this is kind of interesting, where is it? At the bus stops, they had an electrical connection like this. The bus would pull in and the, the connection would be made and an electric motor would get that flywheel spinning really fast. And then it would disconnect and it would have just, <laughs> have just enough energy, well, maybe a little bit more, just enough energy to get to the next bus stop. And when it pulled into the next bus stop, the flywheel was spinning very slowly. It would hook up the electrical connection. The battery would get the flywheel spinning up, get all that stored energy, and it would get it to the next bus stop. This was in the 50s in Switzerland. I had a student a year or two ago, his father and grandfather worked on that bus. They used to uh, help maintain it. They were mechanics. And uh, torque. Uh, so we use torque a lot with, uh, with uh, different things. Um, you know, one of them, you, maybe you've seen people do this or maybe you even do it. You keep a pipe in your car that you can put over the handle of your wrench because if you get a flat tire, most of our tires are pretty good these days. They don't go flat very often. So the lug nuts get kind of stuck. It's hard to, hard to loosen them. Well, what do you do? You, you, once you've, once you've putting all your weight on the wrench, you can't produce any more torque. Well, you slide the, uh, you slide the pipe handle over the handle of the wrench. You slide the pipe over the handle of the wrench. Now you've made the, the handle longer effectively, kind of like this. I'll make it all clear with my artistic ability here for you. 
Okay, there's a nut and you wanna loosen that nut. What do you do? You get a, a wrench. Looks something like this, right? And you're pushing on the end of that wrench and you can't actually, you're tightening it now. <laughs> you're, let's pull. You're, you're pushing this way. You're trying to loosen that wrench, that nut. You're pulling up and you can't get it to budge. It's frozen on there. So you get a pipe and you slide the pipe over the end. And now you can push over here and produce much more torque and get that frozen nut to break loose and change your tire. <clears throat> and all of this leverage right, comes into play with things like, uh, oftentimes when we think of leverage, we think about getting more weight, lifting more weight with less force. But that's not always the, what we want. When we want to lift up a car to change our tire, we want to put in a small force and get out a big force. We want that leverage that we can look at the torque and see how it works. One side has a big lever arm. The other side is a small lever arm. We can put in a big force, get out. Uh, we can put in a small force, get out a big force, that kind of thing. Use leverage. But sometimes, like our arms, our body is designed with the opposite effect. We actually, it takes a big force from our muscle to lift a weight in our hand because the leverage is not set up that way. But why do we have, why are our bodies set up this way? Because a small movement here where our muscle is connected to the bone, there's a very small lever arm there. But that means that a little bit of movement in the muscle and my arm has this big movement. I can reach up and grab an apple off a tree. I can scratch my back. I can do things. And that is advantageous. That helps us uh, be successful and, and uh, survive as human beings. So let you, when you think about leverage or mechanical advantage, sometimes you want to be able to lift a big heavy weight by putting in a small force. But sometimes you want the opposite. Sometimes you want to be able to have a big range of motion by moving something a tiny bit on one side, you want the other side to move a lot. Okay, 10 minute break. Yeah, vertical distance, H is the vertical distance. All right, let's take uh, 10 minutes and uh, we'll be back shortly, I'll pause. All right, let's do an angular momentum problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> when we did the ballistic pendulum problem, we cheated a little bit, right? What we had was a, uh, a block <clears throat> on a thin string. So we call that a simple pendulum. When all the mass is at the end of the pendulum, we call that a simple pendulum. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because we had that situation, we could treat it like a linear momentum problem. We just had a block colliding with the bullet and the string didn't have any effect on it. The string was basically massless. So we could treat that like a, like a linear momentum collision and then worry about what happens afterwards later, right? Now we're gonna, let's, let's give that, uh, Let's make it a physical pendulum. So the, the string is not massless. Let's just make it a solid rod. <clears throat> so we have a 
we have a solid rod hanging there from a pivot point. And I will use um, lowercase l to be the length of the rod because capital L is angular momentum. So I'll try, try to keep those two different. This will be um, the mass of the rod. So uh, Yeah, let me, I'll write it over here. Length L. All right, and we've got a lump of uh, clay. coming along here and it's going to stick. It's going to stick to the end and that board, that rod is going to swing up. This is my timeline. All right, so we'll call this uh, time one. This is just before the collision. We'll call this time two. This is just after. And this is time three. This is later. All right, so given uh, the length, the mass of the rod, the mass of the ball, the velocity, initial velocity of the ball, and we're going to assume that the radius of the ball is much less than the length of the Rod. So we're going to treat the clay like a point mass is what I'm trying to say. Find Find the maximum angle that the rod swings up to. Let me give you a minute or two to think about how you would set this up.
right? So can you get from the beginning of this problem to the end using energy? No, because we have a collision in the middle. And in this case, we know for certain the mechanical energy is not the same before and after the collision because they stick together. And if they bounced off each other, we still wouldn't know because we're not told it's elastic. You'd have to be told it's, in, it's elastic. So we can't go from the beginning to the end using energy. Can we go from the beginning to the end using linear momentum? No, uh, because our rod is attached to the earth. So we have lots of momentum initially, then the earth gets in the way basically. And we can't go from the beginning to the end using angular momentum either, because at the beginning we have angular momentum and at the end we don't. The earth got in the way, the earth pulled on our system and kept it from swinging freely. But what we can do is we can break it up into two problems, right? We can split it. And where do we split it? The split second before the collision, the split second after the collision. That's what I drew here on my timeline. <clears throat> we can get through the collision with some kind of momentum. We're not going to use linear momentum because it's a rod that's rotating in all the mass, right? There's a little bit of mass here in the rod that's rotating. There's a little bit of mass up here that's moving, a little bit of mass up here that's moving. We can't account for all that with linear momentum, but we can with angular momentum. So we're going to get through the collision using angular momentum because this rod is free to rotate about that pivot point, about that axis. And as long as we pick a small enough time interval where the force of gravity can't influence it at all, then this, the net torque is zero for that tiny, tiny time interval. And we can use angular momentum conservation. So we'll go from one to two using angular momentum. And then we'll go from two to three using energy probably, right? All the angular momentum in this case is out of the page. So let's just call that positive. So initially, and at the end, they are stuck together. I guess I should use one and two here. I'll use instead of initial and final. This is at time one. And this is at time two. The ball is an object moving in a straight line. What do we use for that? We use its momentum times the perpendicular distance from the line of the velocity or the line of the momentum to the axis of rotation. Angular momentum and linear momentum are two different things. They are independent of one another don't mix and match. Do not put MV here. That would be wrong. It's 
MVD perpendicular. It has to be angular momentum. The rod is just hanging there, right? It doesn't have any angular momentum. And at the end, we have an object that's rotating. What do we do for objects that rotate? We use I. Omega. So what do we have here? This is just um, this is just L, right? Uh, mass of the ball, the velocity, and the length of the rod because it's if we extend the line of force, d perpendicular is this distance right here, right? The perpendicular distance from the line of the velocity of the object moving in a straight line to the axis of rotation. And on the right side of the equation, what do we have? We've got uh, I for the ball plus I for the rod times omega. We can just add them up, right? Treat them like two separate objects. And the ball, we said, we're just gonna treat like a point object. It's small compared to the length of that rod. So we'll just treat it like a point object. It's the mass of the ball times its radius squared, which is uh, L squared. The radius is not the radius of the ball, right? It's the radius of, to the axis of rotation, right? The distance to the axis of rotation from where the mass is located. And we have a rod rotating about its end point. One third M rod. L squared. And then we're done. We can solve for omega. <clears throat> now we need to use energy. So far, so good. We're using energy and we can say the initial energy and the initial mechanical energy equals the final mechanical energy because we have no friction, uh, no air resistance. All of our forces will be internal to the system, no external work done. <clears throat> Moment of inertia for the ball. I'm treating it like a point object. So a point object is just mr squared, right? What is r? It's the distance from the axis of rotation to the object. So it's just the mass of the ball times L squared. What do we have? We've got something rotating, one half. I, this is for the total, right? The ball plus the rod, omega squared. And we just solve for omega. We know what omega is there. And that has to equal the gravitational energy, right? Now you could do this two ways. You've got, you've got this situation.
we've got this situation. The center of mass of the rod started here and it ended up here. So the rod's center of mass went up by this much, right? I'll call that H rod. And the, I'll use green, the clay The center of mass of the clay went up by this much. I would just probably treat them like two separate objects. I think that's the easiest thing, but you could find the center of mass of the whole system. The center of mass of the system, the rod plus the clay, and then uh, just do so in essence, we're both doing two problems. If you want to find the center of mass of the system, you're doing a center of mass problem first, then you're doing a gravitational energy problem one time on the center of mass of the system. I'm saying it's probably just as easy or easier to do, to skip the center of mass problem and just find the gravitational energy of the ball and the, uh, the rod separately. So I'm doing two of the same calculations, but whatever you like to do, either way is fine. So this is gonna be, the energy here is gonna be the mass of the ball times the G times the height that the ball goes up, plus the mass of the rod times G times the height that the rod, the rod's center of mass goes up, the vertical height change in the center of mass of the rod. So how do you get this? This is going to be, I'll, uh, I'll draw it, let me draw it one more time for the, I'll just do it for the clay ball. It's a little hard to see there. All right, this is L. the length of the rod, and this is L. This is theta. That's what we're trying to find, right? And this distance here is H, what am I calling it, ball? Clay, oh, I'm changing my, oh, this should be, hold on. Let me, let me use the same, the same. Uh, ball, ball, ball. Okay, they're all the same now. Sorry about that. The ball goes up by a certain distance, okay. Uh, so what you can see here is that this distance, this one is L cos theta, right? So HB is going to be L minus L cos theta. And if you do the same the same thing for the rod. All the L's become L over twos. So you substitute those in and you solve for theta.
Uh, why did I break up the potential energy? Because I thought that was easier than doing a, I thought doing the exact same calculation twice, which is what I did here, I thought that was easier than first doing a center of mass calculation to find the center of mass of the system and then doing this calculation. I thought doing two different calculations was a little bit harder than doing the same calculation twice. But either way is fine. First, you could find the center of mass of the system, and then you do one, one gravitational potential energy term here. But either way, we're doing two, two problems, right? Uh, in this case, it doesn't matter. Theta could be whatever you want. You're going to solve for cosine of theta, right? So um, whatever your calculator is set to when you take the inverse cosine is what you're going to get for a theta. Sometimes it has to be in radians, like for the rotational uh, right, if you're, if you're going from S equals R theta or uh, V equals R omega or A equals R alpha, then you must be in radians, right? But that's about the only case we have. Most of the time, you could do whatever you want. Oh, that's a good question. What's the, uh, if that, if the ball was not small, <laughs> if the ball was not small, what's the rotational iner inertia? Let's do that. It's a, it's a good one. Um, so we've got a rod. And we've got a should we make it a solid? Like a clay ball, solid, solid ball, M ball and R, radius R. So we're not going to treat it like a point mass now. <clears throat> Axis of rotation right there. So what's the I for this system? I for this system is going to be I'll do the easy one for you. A rod rotating about its endpoint, one third M rod. Uh, what is it? L squared. I for the ball. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to use parallel axis theorem, right? So first thing we do, we say we've got a ball, we've got an, an axis of rotation up here, and we've got a ball down here that's moving like this. So we say, is there an axis? We looked that up on our table, we don't see that, right? But is there an axis parallel to the one of interest that passes through the center of mass of the ball is that on the formula sheet? Yes.
a solid sphere right here, two fifths MR squared. So we've got now, we've got the ball spinning about an axis through its center, right? And now we have to figure out the distance between this axis and the one that we're really interested in, that's D. So two fifths MR squared is the center of mass, rotational inertia. Uh, hasn't done that for a while. Uh, come on. And the distance, the distance between our center of mass axis and the one that we're really interested in, that's D. And that's L plus R. And there you have it. Add them up and you get your total I. Parallel axis theorem. We use the parallel axis theorem any time we don't find what we're looking for on the uh, formula sheet. So here's, let's just do a few examples. Thin rod rotating about center point. It's on the formula sheet. You're done. Don't need the uh, parallaxis theorem, right? Thin rod rotating about this axis of rotation. Okay, now you can look to see if there's an axis parallel to the one you're interested in that passes through the axis of rotation, there is. You can look up on the formula sheet, the one that goes through the axis of rotation, add MD squared, and you've got this one, right? Uh, same with the disc, a disc rotating about, um, about this point. Again, 
it's the axis of rotation is within the re within the boundary of the object, right? It's not uh, outside of the object. It's within the boundary of the object, but you still need parallaxis theorem because that is not on the formula sheet. Or even, even this one. Okay. All right, let's do a few of these. We're not going to rank them. Let's just find the rotational inertia in terms of L and M. Each one of these bars has mass uh, M and length L. Or maybe I'll call them rods. We've been calling them rods. All right, let's do A. Find I in terms of L and M. Uh, actually, I'm gonna use capital, I always. I'll use capital L for the length. There's no angular momentum here, I don't think, so we won't get confused. Or do I use angular momentum at some point? I don't think I use angular momentum. Okay. A, find I rotational inertia in case A. So far, so good. You're going to add them up, right? You're going to treat them like two separate rods, add the rotational inertias together to get the total rotational inertia. I'll do the easy one for you. I1 is a rod rotating about its end point. One third ML squared. What about I2? <clears throat> Uh, 
Uh, you could, you could. Could use parallaxis theorem. Let's use parallaxis theorem just for the heck of it. So we've got a rod. Got a rod here. We've got an axis of rotation here, right? We want to find an axis parallel to this one that goes through the rod, the rod center of mass. So this is what we're looking for. What's the rotational inertia of the rod about an axis that goes through its center of mass? These are thin rods, right? All the mass is on a single line. No, it's not a cylinder. <laughs> it's not a cylinder. It's a rod, a thin rod. All the mass is at the, on a line. I know my, my, it looks like a cylinder when I hold it up like this, but this is all, this is the only prop I could find handy. And if I held up a, thin rod here, you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. So <laughs> all the mass is at the, on the axis of this uh, cylinder. All the mass is on the axis of the cylinder. So it's not a cylinder, it's a thin rod. So if all the mass is on a, is on a line and we draw an axis of rotation along that same line, then the, all, all the mass is at the axis of rotation. If all the mass is on the axis of rotation, I center of mass is zero. And what is D? D is L over two. Let's think of it a little differently. We've got an axis of rotation. We've got a rod rotating about it, right? Now I'm gonna rotate the view. I'm gonna shift the view by 90 degrees. So the camera now is looking down the axis of rotation. It's going around it like this. It's going around it like this. What does it look like? Looks like, no, it doesn't look like a hollow cylinder. Got it in here. <laughs> That's all I had handy to demonstrate this. Here, thin rod. Can you see a thin rod? No, you can't see it. Well, that's what you're getting anyway. Thin rod, thin rod. There, you see, that's my thin rod. What does it look like? This is my, it looks like a point, yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, this is so hard on video. <laughs> uh, so we don't care that, um, we don't care that the mass is spread out along the axis of rotation. Whether it's a point object, or a thin rod, we spread that mass out and turn it into a thin rod, it doesn't matter. We don't care whether it's a disc or whether we spread it out and make it into a cylinder, we don't care. Uh, so, um, so it looks like a point object.
uh, what do we get here? We get I is one third plus one fourth. And what is that? Seven twelfths. I have to get better props, don't I? Okay, we okay with that one? <laughs> All right, let's do uh, let's do another one. D. D. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, one more time here. If you have an axis of rotation, that's this. Well, I'll just draw it as a line. And you have a point mass. Going around it. I is M R squared, right? R is the distance from the axis of rotation to the mass. Now, if we take that point mass and we put it here, What's I? The point mass is on the axis of rotation. Because R is zero, it's, it's located right on the axis of rotation. It's a little hard for me to that, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> if a point mass means it's literally a point, and that means it can, the mass can be right on the axis of rotation. It has no perpendicular distance away from it. It's all right on the axis of rotation. We good now? So a thin rod, a thin rod is the same thing. Here's my axis of rotation. Here's my thin rod. What's the rotational inertia? MR squared. And if I took my thin rod and put it right on top of my axis of rotation, and I put my rod right on top of it, Is that better? I can draw thin rods. I can't use props with thin rods. Where are we? <laughs> D, we're doing D. Uh,
Uh, let's call uh, this one one and this one two. Okay, the first one, a rod rotating about its middle point, one twelfth. Oh, you've, you're giving me the answers. Okay, got it. Uh, I1 is uh, one twelfth ML squared. I2 is uh, one fourth. We just did it, right? It's M times uh, L over two squared, which is one fourth. And one twelfth plus one fourth is one third. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Our time is up. Uh, I'll stop the recording. I'll stick around if anybody has questions. And uh, there's also the four o'clock office hour. And um, otherwise, I'll see you next time.